Hi, everyone, and welcome to Court Street this week. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. And you may be wondering, why are you holding grocery items, Josh? Well, there are a couple of my you know, favorite items here, some cereal and some spaghetti sauce. And the reason I'm holding these is because we are participating as a church in a food drive for one of our partners, Hope Station. Now we're taking these donations of breakfast cereal or spaghetti, pasta sauce, oil or sugar, and we're receiving those right here in the entryway at the church. We've got a wonderful pantry set up and already is stocked with lots of items. Thank you, all of those of you who have participated thus far in bringing those to the church. Um, You can continue to bring those this week, even during the week. We're uh, open for business and you can come drop off those items. Or perhaps you're uh, one of our digital watchers and you connect with us this way and you think, I can't make it to the church, we, you can make a donation, actually. And uh, just specify in your donation that you would like it to go toward the food drive. And we'll make sure that someone goes shopping and picks up those items and drops them off to Hope Station. Now, Hope Station is this wonderful ministry here in Salem that helps to provide kind of an in-between food source for those who maybe fall in between. They're not able to receive uh, assistance uh, from the government for that, but they don't really have quite enough to make it through the month. Well, Hope Station steps in, and churches like ours and other organizations from all over the city donate food items and uh, family gets families through the month. And so we're excited to partner with them again this year in this way. Um, Man, I'm so glad that you're joining us here on this digital service, whether it be online or maybe you're watching on local cable television. Uh, It's so great to connect with you and to be together and worship in this way. Uh, Maybe you've thought, I would love to come and visit Court Street in person. You know what? I'm excited because we have another opportunity for you to do that. Uh, We have two services now on Sunday morning in person, one at 9.30 and one at 11 o'clock. And you're welcome to come to that. And of course, you're also welcome to continue to worship with us uh, in this digital format each and every week. That will remain at the same time. Man, I'm so glad to be able to be with you today and to worship together. Let's continue in worship. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation.
nothing, nothing is better than you. It's true, you can believe it. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing, nothing. Hi, everyone. My name is Becca Riddle. I'm a pastor at Court Street Christian Church, and I'm so glad that you're joining us today. I wanted to start this week's message out by just giving you a little bit of funny insight about my family growing up. We, um, my kids used to create great words when they were learning the English language. I'm sure yours did too, or maybe even you're still being teased about something that you said growing up that was silly. But I'm going to share with you a few of ours that still lives on famously in our household. Um, a, a trampoline in my house was famously called a jumperline. Don't you love that? A jumperline. And if you had, my husband had whiskers that grew out, my son would call them his pokey pokies. I still use that one. And of jammies in our house were called cozy cozies. Doesn't that sound good to get into after a long day to get into your cozy cozies? And then my favorite is my son used to call our, our washing machine a wash a cleaner, which is still lives on today. And every time I do laundry, I do it in our wash and cleaner. If you had a funny word like that, comment down below or share it with somebody that you're watching with. What were your funny words that your family made up? Well, I share this with you because my husband went uh, to a leadership conference last week. And when he came back, he shared with me a portion of it. And the topic was a, a, a word that I'd never heard before. And he said that we studied followership followership. That, that word all of a sudden started engaging my brain in a whole new way. And I just thought it was so incredibly interesting that this leadership conference would take a moment out of their special time to talk about the importance and the value of followership. Well, honestly, it got me excited and it started me thinking about even just ways that I can incorporate a message like this uh, for our church body. So here it goes. Here's what, here's what I have for you about this. Because our world values leadership so much, I, I mean, even from the time I was small, I remember everybody in elementary school wanted to be the line leader. Everyone wanted to be a leader, and it seemed like that's what you had. You had to be the leader to get your parents to be proud of you. But not very many people talk about the importance of followership. And so today I do want to just stop and pause and talk about um, this beautiful word and how it can inspire us to do uh, that in a more healthy way in our lives. So I saw this great quote. And I wanted to share this with you as we just kind of set the stage for our topic today. So let's read this. It says this, if leaders are to be credited with setting the vision and inspiring followers to action, then followers need to be credited with the work that is required to make the vision a reality. Isn't that a beautiful statement? And doesn't that make you feel proud of the things that you've decided to be a follower in your life? Those things take work and effort and should be valued. So this idea of followership, it's not just uh, this idea that's the newfangled idea. This is actually something we find um, even written in our ancient scriptures that we love to read and, and help us to understand our world even today. And so I wanted to start by just kind of pulling way back into history and seeing where we can start to see the value of followership even back when Jesus walked the earth. So I want to take you back to first century um, Middle Eastern world and give you a context of what it would have been like to grow up in that society. 
how they had structured their society is if you were a, a, of a Jewish family, when your son was about five years old, you would send him to the temple for his education. He would learn to read Hebrew. He would, do memor- he would memorize uh, big portions of the Old Testament, the Torah and the, the prophets and the law. Um, and he would spend his early years in that type of an education system. One of the things that the rabbis were looking at, the rabbis were the teachers of the day, the leaders um, of the the religion of the day. One of the things that they were looking for in their students was to see the few students that were rising to the top, the ones who were able to memorize quickly, ask great questions, the ones that showed the most promise, the brightest. And they would ask those few students after their bar mitzvah at 13, to come and follow them, to be one of their disciples. And it was quite an honor for a young man to be asked to do this. It really separated um, the classes at that point. The kids that, that made it, you could imagine the parents were very proud, and they would go and follow a rabbi. And a rabbi had a certain way of teaching, a certain way of looking at the scriptures, and then that person, that student, then would adopt those for the rest of their life, be bound to the way that their particular rabbi read those holy scriptures. So that's how um, the world was working when Jesus was born into that culture. And what I find so fascinating is the way that he gathered his followers. You're going to see that Jesus, as he sets himself apart as a rabbi, he didn't work within that system. He did something really radical almost. And so I want to turn now to the scriptures, and I want you to start noticing and seeing how Jesus called his disciples or his followers to follow him. So let's read how this looked. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting nets into the lake, for they were fishermen. Now, I I want to stop right here because they were fishermen. So what does that tell you in the context that they were living in? They were two Jewish boys that grew up in the system, but they didn't make the cut. They weren't of the brightest, and they weren't of the, they didn't get the attention of the rabbis to ask them to follow. Those were just a select few. And so they went into a different trade, a different business. Uh, They could have been masonry, they could have um, worked in, uh, they could have been farmers, but these two were fishermen. And so that is how they were making their living, and that's how Jesus finds them. Let's read on. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. This is so beautiful. This really simple invitation from a rabbi who saw two young men who didn't make the cut, and Jesus says, follow me. And not only is he giving them um, a vision for, for, um, for their lives of what's next, he's even kind of projecting what they're going to be doing in the future. They're not going to be fish, fishing for fish anymore. They're actually going to be fishing for men and captivating their hearts in a whole new way. It's a beautiful interaction. And, and even I love how the scripture just kind of talks about this immediate response. These two people that say, yes, I want to follow. And they did. They followed Jesus around. And next I want to show you just kind of what happens right next in his ministry. Jesus just gets going with his few followers that he has. He starts to get to work. Let's see what happens here. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering in severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. And large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the regions across the Jordan followed him. I I love this passage because as Jesus is doing his ministry, 
He's seeing people that are the outcast, the ill. He's seeing people from all over the region. He's uh, casting kind of a wide net. And it says that as he's, he's teaching and he's healing, that there are people that are joining him. His followership is growing because people are so moved by the way he walks and teaches and talks about life. It's captivating their hearts. It's so much so that they want to be followers of Jesus. They're engaging in this word, followership. It's so beautiful. So I love that Jesus just flips the script here. And it's so beautiful because his invitation, you can see, is very personal, and it still is for us today, but it also is for everyone. Jesus' invitation to follow is personal, and it is for everyone. It is so... Um, it, it invigorated me, honestly, this week to see this man as a leader gain his followers. So the other thing that I loved is, is he's proclaiming a different way to look at the scriptures, a different way to live. And when I was telling you about my study that I had of Jewish boys going through uh, their education, one of the things that caught my attention in a brand new way is that their personalized, their interpretation of the scripture, the way that, what they emphasized and the things that they downplayed, the way that they were unique as being a rabbi, that was called their yoke their yoke. And I knew I had heard that word before. And all of a sudden, I, I looked up the scripture of how Jesus used that word yoke. And all of a sudden, this scripture that I've read a million times came alive for me again. I want to read this to you now that you know that bit of information too. Jesus says this, this, another, this invitation to follow him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And I love that he repeats this, this phrase again, like for the people in the back, I want you to know this, my yoke, the way that I, I see God, the way that I am interpreting scripture, the way that I want you to be having this movement just like launched into this world, I want you to know that for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I can imagine that the people who were listening to this, they all just took a big deep breath and they were so agreeable. Yeah, I'll follow this guy. And so you start to see his followership just start to grow. And this is just so compelling for me as a follower of Jesus myself. It was one of those things that I, I heard this movement again. I re-fell in love uh, with Jesus as his follower all over again. The thing, too, is that Jesus wasn't just looking for the best and the brightest he was just seeing so much potential in all of the people, all of the people, and giving them a place in the kingdom, giving them a place to actually follow and do the beautiful work that Jesus invited us to. So as a leader here at church, at, at Court Street, um, one of my... Um, one of the things that I know just really works for me is that I'm not just a leader. I'm also a follower. I'm a follower of Jesus, and I'm a, and I'm a follower and a believer of what our, our lead pastor has set aside for us. And I was reminded of an old friend of ours whose name was Lindy Dobson, who used to attend Court Street. He's a great, a great man. He served two tours in the Korean War as a sergeant in the U.S. Marine Corps. And uh, he was a, a lovely man and a good friend to our family. And of course, he had a lot of leadership ability. But I want you to look at this quote that, that Lindy um, said to us and that I'll uh, never, ever forget. He says, to give an order, you have to be able to take an order. And isn't that the truth? A good leader, a good leader is going to be able to accomplish or, or do and live out the message of his vision or her vision in a, in, a, in a way that he's asking or she's asking her followers to. And so I loved this reminder 
that even a good leader is also a follower. We're still engaged in this followership life that um, is is accomplishing good things, is, is accomplishing good things. Um, and so this started reminding me of why I love this place. As a leader here, I'm still following um, what makes Court Street unique. And there are some things about our vision statement that really like I connect with on a very deep level. I went through and I kind of read this vision that Corey has for our church that he and the elders just agreed upon unanimously and kind of set forth to like create this environment of believers here on this little corner in Salem, Oregon on 17th and Court. It's those things that like we lean into to make us unique and to see God in a fresh way. And I just want to share three vision statements that Corey came up with, three of them, and he has more. They're so beautiful. If you want to look at a sermon series that goes more into depth, just go to our website and check out that sermon series called I Love My Church. You'll find out more information. Let's look at these three. That we as a church are going to be moving towards loving deeply, and we're going to be moving away from loving conditionally. Oh man, I want that in my life. I want to find all those ways that I'm putting conditions on my love or even putting conditions on God's love and moving towards this just loving deeply. I want to move towards this idea that I want to go to people. I want to be where they're at and bring the good news to them. And I want to move away from this idea that they just have to come here to experience that. We want to be a church that's out, that's with people, that's volunteering in all different sorts of organizations so that we can actually be accomplishing what we saw Jesus living out in those scriptures where he went to people and said, follow me. We want to be a people like that, that goes to people. And then this last statement here, we want to be a people that's moving towards compassionate contribution, and we want to move away from critical consumerism. We want to be an active church, an active church that doesn't even have time to complain because we are out doing some beautiful work in in this compassionate way. And those are just three of the statements that, that for me, three statements for me that really get me excited to not only be a leader here, but to also be a follower. To be to be engaged in this, this new word that I learned, followership. And so Today, I just want to focus a little bit on how we want to do that really well. And so I have just a few points for you to write down if you're taking notes. But if we want to be in a healthy relationship with all the things that we are following, then these things might help set our course and keep our focus really well. So number one, number one, that healthy followership requires discernment. Healthy followership requires discernment. Probably about 10 years ago, um, I noticed that our t- one of our toilets in our house was not flushing. I couldn't see an obvious clog. I had no idea what was going on, but it was not flushing. Something was really messing up the plumbing in there. And so my husband, who's super handy, he tried to figure it out. He couldn't figure it out. He finally went to a local um, hardware store, and he asked the young man, told the young man uh, 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 behind the counter our situation, and he plopped down this, like, really strong chemical stuff, and he's like, this is what you got to use. You're going to get it fixed. Do this. And so my husband's like, great. Takes it home, puts it down the toilet, and probably about 15 minutes later, we heard a massive, massive explosion, like huge. So we all walk into the restroom and we see porcelain chunks, water, just just a huge mess in the bathroom uh, because our toilet had literally exploded because of this chemical. Well, um, we, we, um, we didn't know what had happened, so my husband like immediately took this jug of chemical, found the 1-800 number, called the company, and was like, what the heck, man? What happened to my toilet? And the person on the phone just was like, um, it says 
right on it in big red letters, never use in toilets. <laughs> and it was just one of those details that's like, no, we just took someone's word for it. We didn't put a lot of wisdom into thinking about this. And my husband put the whole thing in. And now we are missing a toilet in our house. So, um, you know, just the funny end of this story is that we found out that this was $250 to get a new toilet, and we decided we got to figure out what's going on. And my husband um, reached down and found the culprit. He found the clog, and what it was was hundreds of sucker sticks and candy wrappers just shoved into the toilet. One of my children tried to get rid of the evidence. And so we marched all of them into the bathroom. We told them that this was going to cost the family $250. And we just wondered if anyone had anything to confess. And they all were like, hmm, not me. No, I don't know who did this. And finally, my oldest just looked at us just straight in the eye. And he just said, Mom, Dad, I don't know who did that. But I'm going to tell you that when I grow up and become a millionaire... I'm going to write you guys a check for $250. <laughs> Just totally cracked us up. So listen, back to the point here. That healthy followership requires discernment. This, this requires, you know, your energy and efforts in this world, where you're going to spend your time and talents, uh, that requires just a pause, a nice speed bump for you to ask for some wisdom in this area and to make sure that the leaders that you are following and the vision that you're following for your life is good, is good and is bringing goodness into this world. And so don't be um, afraid to ask questions don't uh, feel like you have to check your brains out at the door. That's not what healthy followership looks like. Healthy followership means that you have a, an understanding of the vision and you've decided wholeheartedly to jump in with both feet and, and be a follower of that vision and spread whatever that is to accomplish around in the world. And so because we, we know that there are parts of our human history that are very shameful, that are things that we, we hate to even think about. And I could write a whole other sermon on that, but I'm just going to touch on it to know that like awful things have been done because people have not been discerning in who they follow and, and the voices that they listen to. And so it is so crucial that we find a vision that gets us excited and that meets our values that we can lean into also. So number two, Healthy followership activates you for meaningful contribution. Boy, we're just designed for this, aren't we? We're designed to do something that makes us feel like we're making an impact in the world. And I think this is honestly one of the most, most important points out of the whole message is that um, leadership would be nothing without people who were following we need people who are out there doing the work to make the mission happen, keep the mission of Jesus happening. And so it, we can even, like, if we decide that we're just going to be kind of passive and even the things that we care about or we're just cheering people on, um, sometimes good ideas and good vision, they just die because there's no people to actually make those things happen. And so this is, this is not only um, a beautiful point for you to lean into and to be challenged by. Are you, are you actually participating in the things that you believe in? Is there a part of you that, that it feels like when you hit your head on your pillow at night, you have a big grin because you know that the things that you did mattered? Um, and if that's not the case, maybe this is a time to think about those things that you follow and to kind of re reinvigorate those passions for you and find a way where you personally can um, make a meaningful impact in those places and people that you are already following. You know, um, through COVID, our, our world kind of had to become stagnant for a while. I can't think of, a, of one area in our world that wasn't touched by the pandemic, um, except for maybe Amazon, they're doing real good. But for most things, uh, we're finding that that some things that we had good momentum in had to take kind of a back seat while we all just kind of had to hunker in and take care of our own. And I know there's lots of tremendous gifts that also came out of that kind of intentional family time. 
but also there are, there are really beautiful ministries out there, churches that are now like, we're ready to get going. But now we need those people to actually activate and to say, I'm here now. I'm ready to step into those places and find out how I can uniquely contribute to a vision that I believe in. And so maybe that's you today and you're just thinking of what is a, where is a place um, that I can step in now and, and see my gifts and talents really being used. And honestly, you know, I am just give you a personal invitation to our church. I love our church. And if you love our vision and you're connecting with it, you haven't become a member yet, or maybe you have been a member, but you haven't found that ministry yet, this is an awesome opportunity. This is an awesome time for you to contact us and tell us about One, why you love this place, and two, where you see yourself getting involved. And we would love to partner with you as we see this place re-engage with some of the the momentum that we lost from the pandemic. We are ready to kind of roll up our sleeves and start working again. We'd love for you to partner with us. Number three, number three, healthy followership means submitting to a good leader. Did I say the word submit? Are we not supposed to say that word anymore? I don't know. That word has gotten a really bad rap, honestly. And there are, have been times when even I would read that in scripture and kind of my skin was, would crawl. But I want you to know I've, I've kind of gone on a journey with this word. And I have a new understanding of what the biblical authors meant when they wrote this word and how, um, how we have, as humans, sometimes have taken that word and twisted it and abused it and made it kind of a bad word. But today I want to reclaim it because there is a healthy way to look at this word submitting or submission. How it was explained to me that started to open up my eyes is that really, submission really works when it's done mutually. When there are people that agree on a vision and a direction and they link arms together and they move forward as one person or one idea. The, the imagery that comes into my mind is if you've ever seen like soldiers linking arms to create safety where they're actually like walking in step with one another. That is a visual picture for me that all of a sudden I, I understood the power and the beauty of what mutual submission looks like. It actually was transformative in my marriage too to really realize that When my husband and I are following a vision for our family um, and we're walking together in sync with that, our children are healthier, our finances are healthier, our, our foundation is healthier. And so for me, that's not a word that I'm scared of anymore really is if you're if you're it's a mutual thing where you you agree with the vision and you are walking in step with that leader honestly beautiful things can start to happen because of that so um, one of the ways that um, we saw this really come alive at our church was we had a beautification day before Easter. It's a day that we set aside every year to kind of have, have lots of, of our, our congregation come together and really spiff up this place, make it real presentable for Easter, and also just give it all a good clean. So here are just a few photos of what can happen when a group of people get together, serve together, link arms, walk in submission with one another, and get things done. It was such a beautiful day. We had people of all ages, all stages, uh, using their own unique gifts and talents to come together and see a vision. Even this little guy helped out here too. We gotta start him young, right parents? (laughs) So, hey, um, I loved this idea that followership is, is not necessarily a bad word. To be a follower of something 
actually should feel very empowering. It should actually feel, when you're doing it in a healthy way, is something that is giving you life and getting, giving the leader and their vision life. It's this reciprocal um, action and reaction that's taking place, and it's actually moving good things in our world. And so this is just a call for you to take a look at the areas in your life that you are a follower. Take a look at them. Reintroduce yourself to the vision or the people that you really find um, motivating. Uh, take a look again at your relationship with Jesus if you have one. Find out how that relationship with this word, if it can even get even more health and vitality in your life, and that you can stand a little prouder and give yourself some dignity for being a good follower. Um, I wanted to actually circle back to a, a, a verse that we talked about in the beginning of this service, um, because for me, it was just so inspiring that as Christians, that this is the voice that we get to be a follower of. So let me read this to you. Let me read this over you one more time here. Jesus says this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Man, I hope that that just uh, makes you feel proud of being a follower. I want to leave you with this one last thought. Let me read this to you. Followership is something we can be proud of. It allows us to accomplish more together than we could have alone. Because of followership, we are still seeing the movement of Jesus still spread into this world. And you, I hope, are a part of it. And if it is something that you're even hearing for the first time today, or all of a sudden it feels like I could get on board with that and the timing is right, I'd love for you to reach out to a pastor here or another close Christian friend and talk about starting the beautiful journey of followership with Jesus. Let me close us in prayer. Father God, um, man, this has been just such an exciting new word for me to discover and even help my own, um, own ways that I follow in this world, help me to feel proud of them. And so I just ask that as we um, are making decisions about who we're going to follow and who we're not, that you just give us wisdom as we're making those types of decisions. And Father, I just ask for anybody who is feeling like this is their time to follow you, that they would actually follow up with that thought and they would contact somebody and make a commitment to you. This beautiful man, this rabbi that came into our world, did things so differently, gave us a beautiful way to view God as for us, not against us, gave us a beautiful message that we got to spread and make our world better, more peaceful, more loving. And Jesus, we just hope that we are giving you our best efforts. And in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right, church, we will see you next week.